Hi all, I'm Sharnaz and my pronouns are she, her. Um, now, many of you might know me as Miss Zarif because I'm a teacher um, and this channel is going to be all about learning and developing ourselves through the humanities. So, I know that at the moment it's impossible to ignore the news and if you're paying attention, you'll know that lots of people are choosing to self-isolate to avoid catching or spreading coronavirus. Um, so, to show you that this isn't the first time in history that this has been done, today I'm going to be chatting to you about the village of Eam during the Great Plague of 1665-66. to 66. Now, if you're studying medicine through time, you might have already heard about this, but for those of you who might find some comfort in the actions of our ancestors, listen up. Because 400 years ago, our northern relatives made the sacrifice of self-isolating in order to prevent the plague from spreading to the north of England. Now, if you can hear uh, a sound right now, that is my dog Beans. Uh, Beans, are you going to come and show yourself to everyone? No, he doesn't want to. Um, so we'll carry on. Anyway... Uh, Eam is a village in rural Derbyshire in the Peak District uh, that self-isolated itself from 1660. I can't hear you. I do have a dog, I swear. There's not like a monster in my house. Um, so they self-isolated from 65 to 66. Um, and a lot of us know already that the plague was sp spread by uh, fleas that travelled and fed on rats. But when there were no rats present, they'd feed on humans, and that is how the illness spread. Um, so the plague first reached Eam in late August 1665 through the arrival of a parcel of cloth sent to the village tailor um, from London, where the plague was at its absolute worst. And of course, despite the plague being at its worst in London, it was still seen as a very kind of cosmopolitan area where they would want to get their fabric from. Um, and the village tailor, Alexander Hadfield, um, had some... Beans, are you going to ruin this video? Yeah, he's going to ruin this video. Now, um, at this time, obviously, we know that London was at its absolute height with the Great Plague, but people still didn't truly know how the disease was spread. Um, and obviously, the fleas would uh, survive for days inside packages of cloth because they were quite warm and people weren't about to stop buying their fabrics from London because it was, as it is today, seen as an extremely cosmopolitan area which had kind of um, the trade coming in through the Thames uh, and you'd want to kind of uh, get all of your things from there. So upon opening the parcel, it of course was not the tailor himself who opened the parcel, it was his assistant, George Vickers, um, and he found the cloth to be a little bit damp, so he opened it up and spread it out nearby a fire to dry. Now, that doesn't sound like too bad of an idea, but unbeknown to him, the cloth was infested with fleas carrying the bubonic plague, and of course, by warming that fabric up, it reawakened the fleas uh, so that they were um, kind of awake again and starting to breed again. And a very short time after that, Vickers became ill and within six days he was dead. Now, it's really, really sad. George Vickers was the first known fatality from the plague in Eam, but the infection spread quickly and during the following three weeks, there were five more plague deaths recorded in the parish register. Um, and by October, end of October, there were 23 more deaths, bringing the total up to 29. So the number of deaths in two months was more than the average annual number of deaths per year in Eam over the previous decade. So there are about 350 people in Eam altogether. So to have 30 people die um, within two months, as opposed to the amount that they would have die over about a decade is really intense. I can see that we've got a visitor. Now, this is my dog Beans. Um, obviously, he's very interested in the story. Um, but if you're interested in finding out more about Beans, I will link you to his Instagram below. Is that okay, buddy? Do you think you can leave us alone to learn now? Mwah. So, as you can probably tell, and much like is happening today, panic began to set in, and those who could afford to leave the village fled. Now, that was around about 50 people all of the gentry class. Um, and if you can think of any um, similarities to today, 
um, then I urge you to think about them for the activities I'm going to include at the end. But I think that that's very, very similar to what's going on with the coronavirus today, the fact that it's only the rich who are really able to leave and kind of get away from it. So, some of the villagers suggested that they should flee the village for the nearby city of Sheffield, which made sense to them to get away from the place that seemed to be infested with plague. But the village clergyman, Mompesson, persuaded them not to do this because he feared if they did that, they were going to spread the plague to the north of England. And by and large, the north of England had actually escaped the worst of it. Um, so... He suggested something much more radical. He said that actually the village should cut itself off from the outside world. They effectively, as a village, agreed to take this really, really selfless action of quarantining themselves, even though it would mean death for many of them. Um, and it did mean death for many of them because the village of Ian was not self-supporting. Um, so to ensure that villagers didn't starve to death, uh, they were supplied with food and other essentials from surrounding villages. Hi beans, no biting. Is this because I'm not paying attention to you? Villages. Now, the Earl of Devonshire and other wealthy neighbours provided supplies at the southern boundary of the village and they created these things called plague stones, or sometimes they're referred to as boundary stones, uh, which served as dropping off points for supplies of food. So to pay for the supplies, villagers would leave money in water troughs filled with vinegar because they had this sneaky suspicion that vinegar would kill off disease. And these measures actually did work. They helped to ensure that the disease didn't spread beyond Ian to neighbouring villages and in this way Ian also wasn't left to starve to death and those who supplied the food didn't actually have to come into contact with the villagers. So again um, maybe that could be another similarity and difference that you think about with coronavirus today. Are we doing enough? Are we helping out the people who might be in need? Are we finding different ways of supporting one another? Okay, that's definitely something to think about. So, Ian continued to be hit by the plague well into 1666, and the rector, Mompesson, he actually had to bury his own family in the churchyard of Ian. Now, that was one of the rules that they introduced. Every family had to bury their own dead to prevent people from coming into contact with plague death bodies um, and to reduce the chances of people catching disease one of the other things that they did was they actually held church services outside um, which actually did work the church was closed off and the services were held outside in the woods now by November 1666 not 1966 November 1666 the plague was pretty much considered at an end However, for Ian, they had lost 260 out of 350 of their population, um, which is terrible. That's an enormous percentage. But the sacrifice of their self-imposed quarantine, it may well have saved thousands of lives in the north of England. Now, you'd think that the impact of these events at Ian might have really, really changed attitudes towards medicine, quarantine and public health at the time. But in the immediate, in the, in the short term, it really didn't do very much at all. So um, prevention of disease, nothing really changed at that particular point. But in the longer term, doctors, medical staff were able to reflect upon the significance and consequences of the actions taken at Ian and they learned from them. Um, so Ian provides a really, really strong example of how isolation of an infection can help stop the spread of disease. And because of their actions, we actually have a far better understanding today of how to limit the spread of illness. Um, and you could even say that what we learned from those villagers in the tiny village of Ian um, is an example of standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, now, if you're not sure what that term means, I urge you to think about it before you Google it, because uh, I think you can work it out. So I think this is an example of standing on the shoulders of giants, because after this, doctors came to realise that the use of a quarantine zone, if actively enforced, could actually prevent the spread of disease from one infected settlement to another. Quarantine then became a really common, common method used in farming to prevent the spread of diseases like foot and mouth. And then in the 19th century, uh, 
during the work of Florence Nightingale in, during the Crimean War, she actually started to isolate patients in hospitals with infectious diseases. So it takes a really long time for a lot of this quarantine and self-isolation to, to really grow and really have impact. But doctors became aware that methods could be adopted to reduce contamination by this point. Um, at EM, this was done by paying for food supplies, by dropping coins in pots of vinegar or water, and preventing the coins from being directly handed from the people who were infected to the uninfected, and therefore preventing that uh, kind of meeting having to take place. EM also attempted to limit the spread of disease by the quick disposal of infected bodies close to the immediate area of death. And again, that was a practice adopted a few years ago to deal with the Ebola epidemic. Um, and furthermore, at Ian Momperson, he also ordered the burning of contaminated items. Um, and during the 19th century, that was taken a step further through developments in hygiene and the sterilisation of equipment and medical clothing for doctors. So we know that the inhabitants of Ian paid a really heavy price for their isolation and some families, they were wiped out completely. But the quarantine zone prevented the plague from spreading to other parts of Derbyshire. Now, Ian provides an example of how isolation of an infection can help to stop the spread of disease. And because of their actions, we have a far better understanding today of how to limit the spread of illness. So I will leave you with this final message before I put a card at the end with some activities for you to have a go at. But did you know that during the Great Plague, when schools and universities were closed, Isaac Newton discovered one of the laws of nature? the theory of optics. Uh, so while it might be really, really tempting to watch TV, play video games, um, get on with some other fun things, um, and I'm not saying don't do that stuff, um, but alongside doing those things, it would be a really good idea to carve out a little bit of time in your day to develop yourself and find out about the world around you because you never know, you could be the next Isaac Newton. Thank you so much for watching this video. Um, I hope you have a good time doing the activities at the end. If you have any questions or if you've got any suggestions for future videos, please pop them in the comments down below.